How many of you find people were here last year? Good mix. Uh, I'll go quickly over stuff that's old and try to get to the new. So JavaScript is 18 this month. I think it was, I reconstructed the dates. I lost my um, notes and computer from that era long ago, but I had 10 days in May to do something that became more than a demo. It became the first version of JavaScript. And I've been paying for it ever since, but um, now it's not my responsibility. It's 18, so um, it can go out and <laughs> it can you know, vote, join the Navy, get drunk, um, gamble in most states. And I think it's good because people have figured out how to evolve JavaScript. This is a theme I'll come back to later. Uh, JavaScript being done in such a rush, I, I had to make it mutable and extensible, and that's why it's so protein. You can make it be what you want. You can make it look like Ruby if you want. Uh, there are, of course, various ways to compile the JavaScript. We'll talk about that, too. But JavaScript's everywhere now, and we have a healthy standards process. This was hard fought. Somebody recently ran into our standards group in a larger setting and said, wow, you guys seem like a family that's been through a lot together. That's very true. Um, and, and we're working pretty effectively among all the major browser vendors, Yahoo, um, Adobe's in there again. It's good. And Adobe's all about HTML these days. It's great. So I'll, I'll have some demos to show. Um, the goals of, of the standardized, evolving version of JavaScript, and we try to do everything uh, with consensus as we go. We don't try to surprise each other in the standards body, or people would get grumpy at dinner, uh, is to be a better language for applications. We're seeing lots of applications being written at various scale. You have to be able to start small with JavaScript, but then get big. And getting big is not what it was designed for, so we're evolving it. That means you also want libraries. You want to be able to break your code up into modules. There already are lots of great libraries, like jQuery, of course, but they were making do with JavaScript as it was standardized uh, over a decade ago. And it's moving again, so we have to look at where are the gaps in the language that make it hard for library authors to ensure that they can be re reliable, that their libraries work the way they intend. And we're also uh, looking at code generators. So for the first two points, um, I wanted to say people think it takes years to get a new standard. I can't wait. It turns out you don't have to wait. The way HTML5, which we rebooted in 2004 among Apple, Opera, and Mozilla, and then got back into the, what, W3C um, somewhat later, and the JavaScript standard ECMAScript work is that you work in a committee and you work in your browsers to develop new ideas and prove them. You try to talk about them and specify them as you go, and so you end up with implementations already in the major browsers. And um, it turns out there's lots of stuff coming. This was leaked from Internet Explorer 11 from a fairly early build, it seems, and there's all sorts of great stuff coming from ES6. It's even going to be in IE 11. Can't speak for Microsoft, but I believe it. I read it on the web. Uh, even WebGL is there. Um, so awesome, Microsoft got on board with WebGL. That's very important, and I'll show why in a minute. There's also Kangax's great table. He did this for ES5, the last version of the standard. He's got one for ES6. A lot of red there, but if you look at, I'm running Firefox Nightly, that first column on the left shows a fair amount of green coming in. So we're, we're prototyping in Firefox. Chrome is, is prototyping too. Um, and I think some of this red is almost green in Chrome, so it's getting there. Um, we'll see about... Um, JavaScript core and Safari, that, that may take a little longer, but they're working on it too. And so don't despair. You don't have to wait. You can use new browsers. If you have a leading edge site or a mobile content site, you see newer versions faster. Let me talk about some of the things that I haven't talked about, I didn't talk about a year ago. Arrow functions are a concise function syntax. People complain about eight letter keyword function and all the further typing you have to do to return a value. You have to type curly brace, return, space, or more, and a close curly brace. That's at least what you have to type. It's at least, what, 15 characters, 17 characters? It's too much. So inspired by other languages, as you find arrow functions in a lot of languages, we've finally managed to get these uh, standardized in ES6. It took a lot of doing because people didn't want to add the thin arrow that CopyScript has, so we only added the fat arrow, and it, it saves you from having to worry about what the meaning of this is. You don't get into pronoun trouble. 
Um, you can have either an expression or a braced body. The braced body wins, so that first empty function is a braced body, not an object literal. Uh, if you want to use a shorthand inside object literals, there's the method shorthand. So instead of update colon function, you just drop the colon in the function and you write update. That's handy, and it'll come in in classes. Classes are controversial. When I first started talking about them in 2006, people accused me of trying to turn JavaScript into Java, which I would never do. Um, but the committee has wanted for a long time to do what languages like CoffeeScript do, and that is to make it easy to write prototypal inheritance patterns. Right now, you use functions. You have to set the prototype or be careful in how you do super classes. Um, there's some hassles. It, it looks like this when you write it by hand, and that's only one way of doing it. There's, there's lots of choices and lots of ways to go wrong. So it's a lot nicer to have class syntax, and it does de-sugar. That is, it, it turns from that sweeter syntax into the stuff you know, so it interoperates with existing libraries. You can mix and match. You can compose. You can even do it, uh, assuming we get this standardized, this one's still kind of on the fence. You can even do it using this object.mixin API. Looks a lot like that class, but it's all done through calling an API, which means you could do it in older, older browsers without having to get a, a compiler to handle the new syntax. We're also doing modules. This is extremely important for dealing with programming in the large. As you scale your application or your libraries up, you end up wanting to make walls or fences between the modules so you know what's on the inside and what's on the outside. You separate the exports from the internals, and clients have to import what's exported and only that. And you actually get some checking to make sure you didn't misspell a method name. And it's very much responsive to what's been going on in the NPM and the uh, AMD or required JS worlds. Where we're tracking the use cases and trying to match them. So we hope to have a smooth migration path forward from those module systems that were built sort of with you know, scotch tape and, and, and wire and whatever was lying around in JavaScript as it is today. Having a real module system lets you do more. It fills in gaps in the language. It lets you have error checking. That's cool. Um, I'll go quickly here because I don't want to get mired in these details. But one of the things in JavaScript that annoys people is that every name of a property in an object is equivalent to a string. Even the array indices, like 0, 1, 2, are like strings. And there's no way to avoid colliding except by making up really random names. We've added something that people may recall from the Lisp language and other languages derived from it, which is a, a symbol. It's a unique non-string name. You cannot spell it with any string. It will not collide with anyone. And here's an example where just by calling symbol, you get a fresh, unique identifier. Um, I think type of says it's a symbol, so you know it's not an object or a string, and it behaves differently. This is a special case to allow you to extend object prototype in this example without fear of collision with anybody. And you can share this symbol with others. You can use it to um, cooperate without collision. Some of this is now in SpiderMonkey on by default. It's in Chrome. That's in Firefox. It's in V8 and Chrome, I think under a flag, but it should be off soon because it's, it's getting settled. As we standardize the pieces that go into ES6, they start to get turned on by default, and they interoperate. That way, we know we have a good spec. We have developers actually using them. So here's default parameters. If you ever got tired of looking in the arguments object to see what was really passed to you, because you don't know, you have a function that takes a variable number of arguments, now you can assign default values. They can actually refer to parameters to their left. They're evaluated in the context of the activation of the function. You don't get any funny business like in Python, where they're, they're evaluated once when the function's evaluated. Um, rest parameters are another improvement over the arguments object. And someday, I hope we can just put a stake through the arguments object's heart, um, and I'll, I'll do the hammering. So rest parameters are a way of writing dot, 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 and a name, and that captures all the trailing arguments in a real array, as you can see. You don't have to hassle with array.prototype.slice.call of arguments. Um, and that's sweet. And there's a dual of rest, which is kind of a limited operator or a special form. It's dot, 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 followed by some kind of iterable expression in certain contexts, like in an array initializer in square brackets or in an actual parameter list, like in the call um, to G, uh, sorry, in the call to F inside G there, you can take the dot, dot, dot and spread the values of that array-like out or that iterable out as actual parameters, as actual element initializers in the array literal. So these things are re really uh, complementary to each other, and they help us get rid of the arguments object, and they help us compose arrays more flexibly than by calling methods. Um, and in, I mentioned iterables. We have a new form of iteration. This is 
instead of for in, which almost goes over the names of, or the keys of an object, the names of its properties that are enumerable, now you can iterate in a flexible, extensible way. There's a protocol for it. You can extend your objects to do whatever makes sense. You can get batteries included iterators for arrays, like in this example. Uh, instead of saying for v in that array, where you get 0, 1, 2 as strings, you get the actual values, 1, 2, 3 as numbers. Finally, um, I mentioned objects being a little bit funky because they use names that equate to strings, module of this new symbol idea. We're adding something called a map, which lets you map values to values. So you can have objects as keys. You can have um, different kinds of keys, like a string key, named string key in that example, map.set. You can have numbers as keys, booleans. All the values can be used as keys, and they don't get converted to strings. And you can tie knots between the, the rows of the map if you want. Um, and you can delete. And there's a size, and there's a for of loop to iterate over them. If you don't want to use a map for a set, you can use a set directly, and that saves you from having to figure out what values the key should have. It just has the elements of a set, just like in school. Um, and then we have something called weak map. I won't get hung up on it. It just avoids leaks in certain cases. It's, it's a smarter way of managing tables where you might have a knot tied between the, the entries in the table, between the keys and the values. And it will not leak memory. Uh, as much as map will. None of these uh, abstractions will leak in the sense that make a permanent loss of memory. You still have the garbage collector. You still can kill the map and get rid of all the storage. But weak map actually is more efficient about collecting partial garbage inside itself that's no longer reachable, even if it's tied into a knot. Um, and then proxy, this is, this is too much for this talk, but proxies are another powerful way of doing metaprogramming, which is to say programs about programs. You can change the language. You can add your own magic objects. It used to be only the DOM and the so-called host objects, like IE's um, alert function, were magic. Now you can make your own. This is not a bad thing. It actually lets us tame the crazy DOM and the host objects and kind of bring together the, the magic that was built in and the non-magic that you were limited to in old versions of the language and put them on the same footing so we can help you make libraries that are as expressive as the DOM, can substitute for the DOM, you can do mocks. Uh, it's important to have this facility, even though it's kind of low level. And here's an example that shows no such method, something I added this spider monkey a long time ago. You can actually emulate that with proxies. So the, the next part of this talk is going to be about code generation. Since JavaScript is so ubiquitous and becoming so fast, people are writing compilers from other languages to it. And that's fine. JavaScript is not by far <laughs> the ideal language. It's, it's a little bit verbose. It's a little bit warty from the old days, from the rush. Um, at age 18 now, I guess you can go get cosmetic surgery, but it's hard to take things away on the web. You generally have to extend the language with new things and let the old things die off. So people who want to use a different language should be able to, and they are, through using compilers or what are called transpilers, transcompilers. And um, so I'm going to switch to um, a talk about how this works, in particular when you're dealing with, with games. And C++ and C, very low-level languages. Didn't think this was possible until a few years ago when somebody named Alon Zakai, who works for Mozilla Research, developed mscripten, which is a compiler from C or C++ or any LLVM source language, if you know what that is, to JavaScript. And it turns out it actually works. I'm going to demo something we showed at GDC um, with Epic Games. It's to demonstrate that you can run AAA games and the tools that get you there and, and the JavaScript subset that gets you there. Why AAA games? Um, I used to go to GDC for years. I had this dream that I would end up doing computer games uh, instead of browsers. I don't think that's ever going to happen, but it was really cool and informative. One of the years, I heard a talk from Valve's CTO. Um, and he said, yeah, we have to use all the hardware. We're in a competitive you know, market, we have to use the GPU, we have to use the parallel hardware. Turns out games really do everything. And so if a browser could run a high-end so-called AAA game and um, work, it's like if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. So this is a real acid test for the browser. And you wouldn't think it would work. You think, oh, the web's too slow. You know, well, we, we know better now. We added things going back to HTML5 in 2004. Canvas, audio, um, but audio is only like single-shot DOM objects, not good for games. Then WebGL came in. That's really good for games. It's one of those low-level APIs that lets you 
support existing OpenGL games, for instance. And with WebGL came typed arrays, very important. I'll get to those. And a bunch of other things, and storage, and new APIs for input, like pointer lock. And then things got really crazy recently. We have WebRTC we're working with, with the Chrome guys on for NWAY, low latency, like better than Skype, audio, video, and data communications. So multiplayer games would want this. Um, Web audio, uh, the Google guys developed very good low level um, positional um, multi effects, multi shot effects, important for games. And when you put it all together, and then you say, wow, I could really do an awesome work uh, porting a game to this, but I, I still have JavaScript. What am I going to do? I have all these great games written in C and C, these low level languages. Well, the answer is Imscripten to compile JavaScript from C or C. And Asm.js, something, and that's how you pronounce it, by the way, Asm.js for targeting a version of JavaScript, a, p a subset of JavaScript, not anything non-standard yet, to get really fast performance. Um, when we talked about this at GDC, we talked about only twice as slow as native code. I have even better news today. Um, so this awesome platform is here, and now you can reach it from native code. All these games that were written, million-line code bases, can be run efficiently. And um, let's, let's see what that looks like. One of the things we're still working on is code loading. And so there is a, a bit of a pause here loading. This is the Epic Games sanctuary, sanctuary level from Unreal Tournament. And it's running without a plugin. I remember a year ago, I showed our banana bread demo game with some funny <laughs> rabbit squirrel, um, which, was, which was fun. But this is a real game. This is Unreal Engine 3. Plugin free, compiled from C to JavaScript. And um, here's just a bit of the fly through. And now I'm going to show you my mad skills, which aren't really that mad. There's some bots killing each other down here. Let's see where they are. Come on, you bots. Aha. Yeah, they are. I've learned you have to be aggressive here. Yeah. Also, it helps to be invincible. I want to get melee mode here. Multi-kill. Oh, they're shooting each other. Come on, you guys. I'm over here. All right, enough of this. Um, Unreal Engine 3. And we're working on Unreal Engine 4, which is a super awesome engine. It's unbelievable. With uh, Epic Games, Tim Sweeney. Um, kudos to them. Let me get out of here. <laughs> Good thing I'm invincible, or I'd be in trouble. Um, so you didn't think that was possible. And it wasn't possible a year ago. And just to say how, how hard it was, we, we spent about four months, I think, with like one engineer on the JavaScript team, uh, alone the Kai Mozilla Research. The JavaScript guy was Luke Wagner. Dave Herman did the type system for Asm.js to prove everything can be safely compiled to like assembly code. And then we went to Epic in, in Raleigh for like five days, and we, we just ported the engine in the, like four of those five days. And they couldn't believe it was so fast. So shortest path evolution works. I keep saying this on Hacker News, and people don't believe me. Um, they should. So how does this work? Um, and why JavaScript? You know, you think, oh, we can do better with, with um, you know, Java or Flash. Well, the plugins seem to be dying, and the mobile web is killing plugins, among other things. And JavaScript's everywhere. It, it, it really is um, nearly ubiquitous. It's in televisions. Like, the web is starting to be important to televisions, even though it's the big screen and you don't, you know, you consume more than you do interact. Um, but it's coming. And it can be really fast. We know this ever since 2008 when, you know, V8 and SpiderMonkey and JavaScript Core started this performance race. Um, and it's, it's culminated in crazy performance even for dynamic JavaScript, not for this ASM.js subset. You look at games, you look at these investments, they need to use a language like C++. They've been using it already. They have to port it to other platforms. It's the right low-level runs everywhere by compiling ahead of time language. So there's no, no way they're going to rewrite in JavaScript. And if they rewrote in JavaScript, it would get slower. I'm here to say that. But by using a compiler, you can generate this low-level JavaScript and get much better results. You get speed. Um, even in modern engines, plain old JavaScript, everybody recognizes that. Things have gotten really fast. You can tell that this loop up to some limit is going over numbers. Maybe it's, it's even going over integers, and you can speculate that way, like V8 and SpiderMonkey and all the other, other engines do. But 
Um, you could do even better with memory if you could model it with one of these typed arrays. See that in 32 array, that's one of those WebGL typed arrays. And it's pretty big. So make a big one, pretend it's your memory, and suddenly you've got fast, low-level access. You're treating each unit of memory as a 32-bit integer. You can treat it as a byte if you want. You can actually treat it as either. So it starts to remind you of that Intel assembly code you may have had to deal with uh, if you are a programmer as old as me. And when you generate JavaScript from C++, C++ is a typed language. So apart from unsafe casts, you actually have well-typed JavaScript. The engines can eat that up even better if they know that it is well-typed, if they can verify that quickly. And that's part of what we're doing. We're making a, a version of JavaScript that is verifiable. Now, if you don't do this, you get into trouble. You get very large code bases. You get garbage collection pauses. You get misspeculation. The engines are saying, I think it's an integer. Oh, but I was wrong. I give up. You know, it's a number. Or it's an object. It's any type. I don't know. And it starts to slow down. You get recompilations. Oh, I speculated wrong. It was an integer. Now it's a, a double precision number. I'm going to have to recompile. That hurts. That hurts gameplay, especially. You get game lag and pauses. With ASM.js, you get none of that. You get predictable performance, no garbage collection. All your memory is in this big typed array that matters. Um, you still have a stack for fast function calling. That's run by the JIT. You have um, integer types that stay integer types. You have double types that stay double types. You even, and we could extend the language for this, and we're looking at this, have floating point 32-bit types, very important for GPU programming. And it's compatible so far. If we get beyond this, it'll be by evolving JavaScript to make ASM.js still be a subset but have new affordances like those 32-bit floats. Um, because it's a subset, it can be optimized, but it already runs pretty well. So those demos, uh, there were some bugs to fix in Chrome, but they actually, I think at this point, should work on Chrome. You can go to Unreal's, uh, to Epic's game site, and you can run them in Chrome. You'll just see they run a little bit slower. And that we're used to. We're used to performance wars with each other where we catch up. So we're hopeful. And there's a bug open, and there's some work to make ASM.js go faster. And at Google I.O., they talked about some improvements. So I'm going to use the latest V8 numbers to show that they have made improvements. Still not as fast as, as SpiderMonkey and Firefox. What does it look like? It looks like this. You see those vertical bar zeros? That's the bitwise logical OR operator, the bitwise OR operator, I should say. Something I added in the early days, because I'm a C hacker. It was in Java. It should be in JavaScript. It's a good thing I added it, because it lets you say, hey, this is really an integer. By saying OR, or zero, you're converting pointer, that variable there, stored back to itself, into an integer. And once you know that, it, that it dominates all uses of its have a pointer, then you know it's an integer forever, and you don't have to worry about misspeculations. And there are, indeed, other compilers like Mandrill that do this, too. Um, so kind of said this already. It's important to get this level of performance predictability for games. We wouldn't have it if we just used dynamic JavaScript. I've seen people rewrite from C++ to JavaScript and get into garbage collection trouble and misspeculation trouble. Here's the latest benchmark results. Um, blue is Firefox. Red is Chrome, I think uh, Bleeding Edge. And you can see for micro benchmarks, the first nine were actually, in one case, supposedly faster than native code. I think that's because of a Clang bug. I think GCC is actually faster than either Firefox or Chrome. But for these micro benchmarks, you can already get close to the one on the x axis. That means the same speed as native. The real test is the larger benchmarks Box 2D, um, the Bullet Physics Engine. Java n-body solver, Lua binary trees, Lua Symark, Zlib. These are real chunky pieces of code that are not micro benchmarks. They're not trivial. The code doesn't all fit necessarily in the cache. And you can see the blue Firefox is actually pushing below two times slower than native. It's 1.33 times slower than native for Box 2D right now. That was something we didn't know we could do a year ago. That means we're in spitting distance of native code speed. Yet with the reach of the web, which everybody wants, game publishers want that. They do not want to have another plugin that users have to download and install with a scary dialogue and loss of user acquisition as users say, I don't want a plugin. They want the web. And now the web can do this. So um, 1.33x, that's the figure of merit. When we were at GDC just a couple of months ago, it was 2x. So we're pushing toward one point, you know, small change, x slower than native. And I think we'll get there for certain, certain programs. Um, but it's not for hand coding. I know people who've tried to do this. There's a guy on GitHub who's doing it by hand. He's actually doing a good job. Asm.js is like assembly code. Don't listen to the pointy-haired boss. You don't write it by hand. If you do, and you look in your, your JavaScript console, you'll see probably you made a mistake. You'll see a verification failure. It's really for compilers and 
that's why we were able to show the great win we showed with Epic Games at, at GDC and that I showed you guys today. Um, JavaScript running C and C++ big games, JavaScript being a compilation target for CoffeeScript and other languages of that sort, JavaScript evolving as a good language for people to use on its own merits makes me think um, JavaScript is, is, is evolving, and the web is evolving. You may object that sometimes evolution produces uh, a pelican that looks like a urinal. <laughs> that pelican is a beautiful creature, and it's, it's, it's happy. The web is actually evolving in a healthy way. If we only we collaborate on it as we try to do on the JavaScript standard, on HTML5, on web audio, things like that, the web can do anything. And uh, I say always bet on evolution. It's uh, maybe a little bit less catchy than what I usually close with, which is always bet on JS. Thanks.